naturopathic doctor, and unfortunately in school, I mean, we learn amazing principles of how to treat a person um, holistically, but one thing we never learned about was vegan plant-based diets, and this is something pretty new. So I did transition my practice to a vegan plant-based practice in early 2018, so I'm really happy about that. So, what is naturopathic medicine? Before I go there, I want to know who my audience is. So, how many of you are, are actually vegan? Wow, like a lot of you. How about vegetarian? So some of you. And how many of you are, are still omnivores and um, looking to get more information? So some of you. So we have a bit of everyone. So, I mean, today's lecture should help all of you. So first of all, I'll tell you a little bit about what naturopathic medicine is and how many of you have a naturopathic doctor and know what it is. Very few of you, right? We're a small profession. I mean, there's only two accredited colleges in Canada, so there's not many of us. We are a growing profession. Um, so I'll, I'll explain what we do, and it's, it's really interesting. We are a very comprehensive healthcare system. We focus on the physical, emotional, and mental aspects of a patient. So we always look at a patient holistically. Um, I mean, we spend a lot of time with our patients. First visits can be 90 minutes, up to two hours. Um, we, we really get to know people, like everything from what they eat, what time they wake up, who their family members are, where they work. So we can really get into the patient's life and see how we can help them. Because ultimately, advice is only good enough if the patient can use it, right? So, you know, if you're giving health advice that patients cannot even adopt and use, it's, it's useless. Um, and so it's a functional medicine. So what we look at is optimizing your health and not simply be free of disease. One of the favorite quotes that I know of is, health is not simply the absence of disease, right? It's about optimal health. And I tell people, if you're not feeling eight to nine out of 10 every single day, you can do better, right? So I wanna talk about that as prevention, optimal health, um, and naturopathic medicine incorporates um, scientific research, conventional medicine, alongside with holistic medicine. So some of the traditional medicines that nowadays, it's funny, you see a new research come up about probiotics, about how great it is, when really we've been using probiotics for hundreds of years. So a lot of the old medicine is coming out now as if it's new, but it's not new, it's actually old. Um, and so we really look at that, and we also want to make sure everything we do is evidence-based and not simply based on beliefs and traditions, and so, you know, everything we do is backed by good science. Um, and we look at the root cause. What is really causing a patient's health ailment? Often it could be completely unrelated to your symptom. You know, if someone comes in and they have a headache, it may have nothing to do with your head, right? It could be actually something that you're eating, it could be a food sensitivity, uh, it could be a chemical sensitivity, and I had that when someone who was actually a sensitivity to mold that they had in the house, and they would have these chronic migraines. So it's really interesting. So what treatments do we offer? Okay, we do lots of things. So we are trained in conventional medicine, which means we do physical exams like family doctors. We can um, do blood tests. Um, the one thing we can't do is send people uh, straight to, let's say, a specialist, ultrasounds, that you still have to go through your doctor. Uh, we're trained in traditional Chinese acupuncture and cupping, herbal medicine, plant-based nutrition. Again, that's not taught in the college at the moment. It's holistic nutrition that we learn. So plant-based nutrition is something that, you know, I've really worked on obtaining. Um, homeopathic medicine, dietary and lifestyle counseling, which is huge. So no one leaves the office without a good dietary and lifestyle counseling session. Um, I'm also certified in intravenous and infusion therapy. Uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, it's high dose vitamins that are infused through the vein. So we do use that for a lot of conditions, especially chronic, um, really ill patients. We do vitamin injections, NES therapy, and lab testing as I said. Whether you're vegan already or not, it's really good for you to know one thing. Um, what are the health benefits of being a vegan? Okay, so this is based on the Adventist Health Study 2, which is a huge study since 2002, based on 96,000 subjects, and it's an ongoing study. It's an incredibly done study, you can look at it online, um, all the research is there, and to date, these are the stats that we see, and they're remarkable. I mean, the science is undeniable. So first of all, vegetarian men have on average nine and a half years longer lifespan. Women, six and a half years. We're talking about reduced mortality risk by almost a decade. 
in men when you adopt a plant-based diet. 75% um, low risk of hypertension. Uh, vegans rank the lowest in BMI, which is body mass index. So when we're talking about dealing with obesity, diabetes, I mean, lowering your BMI is very important. Um, we have 32 to 42% less risk of heart disease, 62% lower risk of diabetes. So we're talking about the leading causes of mortality today, which is heart disease, diabetes, obesity, you name it. A vegan diet is by far the most ideal diet to be on. We also have 19% lower risk of cancer, 52% lower risk of kidney disease. And what they have found was most people with kidney disease is contributed due to the heart disease and the diabetes. So when you reduce your risks of those two big issues, you also see a lower risk of kidney issues. 72% lower risk of diverticular disease, which is a gastrointestinal disorder. So we're looking at everything gastrointestinal, like Crohn's, inflammatory, irritable bowel, so many issues are actually better on a vegan plant-based diet. So the bottom bullet is inflammation. So you guys may have heard of the word and you know, you hear inflammation, inflammation, what is inflammation? Well, inflammation is common in every single chronic health disease, including Alzheimer's, heart disease, diabetes. And what they have found was vegan plant-based dieters have the lowest inflammation. So overall, you can see that vegans have a lower risk of mortality. And this is just one study. There are multiple studies going on that show very similar results. And if you look at the blue zones in the world, right, the blue zones are areas where people live the longest. One thing in common is they all eat a highly plant-based diet with very little animal protein. So is that, are those not good reasons to be vegan, right? But common myths, and these are concerns a lot of people have about, you know, I don't know if I should go vegan, I don't know if it's good for me, maybe it's not right for me, and these are just a few things I get all the time. Um, Number one, it's there's a belief that vegans are more nutrient deficient than non-vegans, and hence we have to take supplements. How many of you have heard of that? You know, vegans are weak. Vegans, you know, you're gonna have, you're, you're gonna need multiple supplements and so forth. Um, second is vegan diets may not be healthy for you in the long run. And I had a few people come up to me yesterday who said, "Ah, oh, I've been a vegan. I'm thinking of going back." Right? And I said, how come? So they said, oh, I don't know, I don't feel very healthy. You know, I, and I said, hold on a minute, it's not about you being vegan, it's probably because you're not on the right vegan diet. Um, I always tell people, being vegan is step one. It is important that you adopt a healthy vegan diet and lifestyle to maximize and to get those health benefits that we see in the research. Number three, B12 and iron deficiency only occurs in vegans, right? We've heard that or some people are just not suitable to be vegan, or I feel worse on a vegan diet, it must be because there's no animal protein, um, and I don't get enough protein as a vegan. This is important because this is for all patients. We are not educated in nutrition. Most people learn their nutrition from commercials, right? Who has learned nutrition in school? Grade schools, they don't teach nutrition. They don't teach nutrition in general. So we learn that whole wheat bread is good for us. We learn certain things because the commercials say so. But you know that's not really what the research says. And we really have to learn this. It's not something that we just kind of adopt. So you know, being a healthy vegan does take some research, right? You do need to study it a little bit, but it's not hard. So before I go to the solutions, which is how to take action, um, I first need to cover what are the common pitfalls that we find in vegans and vegan diets or when people are transitioning. Number one is not doing your annual checkups. Like how many of you have done your annual checkup within the last 12 months? So like 10% of you? Okay, so many of you have not been to the doctor. <laughs> Take advantage of your OHIP. We are very lucky here, we have coverage, so please make sure you all go for your annual checkup. Even though you may feel like you're really healthy, you don't have any health issues, the key is we need a baseline, okay? Before you start anything, you need a baseline. How are you doing today? What is your cholesterol like? What is your blood pressure like? We need to know right now what it is. And so that moving forward, we can track you. You know, every six to 12 months, how are you looking today versus five years ago? We can start seeing trends because this is part of the whole 
prevention, optimal health, is we want to catch things early before they start skewing way out of normal. Number two is eating a highly processed diet, and I see this in 80% of vegans I meet, is they're vegan, but they're eating a lot of processed foods. So you're still gonna be at risk of a lot of the chronic diseases, because some of it is not just the animal products, it's also the processed foods, the refined foods, the sugars, the high fats, the oils, the frying, all of that. Those are still gonna put you at risk. So eating a highly processed vegan diet, you know, it's a good transition. So I tell people, if you're, you're, you're starting off, you're trying to get off that burger, sure, you know, go get some Beyond Burgers, go get some, you know, Eve sausages, you know, you have to transition, right? But once you've mastered going vegan and you're now 100% plant-based, you got off your dairy, that's a big process already because animal products are highly addictive. So they are altering your brain chemicals. So it does take a time period for you to get off the animal products, to be on the vegan products. But then after you've accomplished that, then you have to start cleaning it up bit by bit. So we'll talk about processed diets and how you can do that. Number three is really important, is ignoring your symptoms. Okay, as I said, if you're not feeling eight to nine out of 10 every day, you gotta check in with yourself. You know, what is going on? Is it your mood? Is it your energy? You know, I get people every day in my office where their stress is nine out of 10, they sleep five hours, and they wake up three times a night. Um, they feel tired when they wake up. How many of you feel tired when you wake up? Okay. How many of you, and this is a bit graphic, but how many of you actually go to the bathroom every single day? Not all of you. Okay, not all of you. So, <laughs> so your gut is, is impaired, right? So we have to check in with your, ourselves and the basic functions of the human body is eating, pooping, digesting, right? So you check in with yourself. Am I eating well? Am I going to the bathroom well? Do I have energy and do I sleep well? And if anything in those four categories are nothing but your best, then you know it to start affecting your body. Those are your basic bodily functions. And then it will go on from there. You ignore the symptoms, then we start seeing patients with hormonal issues, right? Or they have other issues with their digestion, their skin, their hair falling out. We get this all the time, my hair is falling out, right? Why is my hair falling out? Why do I have headaches? Why do I wake up and I need two cups of coffee to keep my eyes open, right? So, you know, there is an issue there and we have to find out what it is. So don't ignore your symptoms. Another pitfall, I don't really want to call this a pitfall, I want to call this a challenge we have, um, is there could be emotional strains, um, more so in vegans, especially whatever reason you became vegan, whether it's for the climate, ethical reasons, for your health, you know, a lot of vegans do feel a bit isolated, you know, especially when you're just transitioning, it's so important that when you do a transition, you make new friends, you create new support networks. Because you may find that a lot of the people who were in your life before are no longer aligned with you like you thought so. And that can cause a lot of emotional stress, right? I've had lots of people where that's kind of the main reason why being vegan's hard, like they can't eat with their friends or, you know, they, they for ethical reasons, you know, you can't eat with them anymore because you see the animals and you just, you know, there's a lot of stress. So, you know, first is make new connections with people and look at this whole room, look at this festival. If you're dedicated, if you're like, you know, your intention is I need to make some new friends, you just have to ask, right? Okay, so make sure, now, being vegan, does not give you a free pass to eat anything you like because we are still susceptible to chronic health diseases. We still live in a world where there's chemicals everywhere, there's pollution, so we are exposed every day by oxidants, we call them. Next thing is how to take action, okay? So this is really important for all of you. Number one, seek a practitioner who is supportive of you being vegan. I mean, it is a challenge today. I mean, still, there are still very few plant-based vegan practitioners, but you know what? Keep calling because this is what will make us change. This is kind of why I transitioned my practice into plant-based practice was because of the demand. You know, I was vegan for over four years. Um, I, I'm, I've been running Peace for Paws and Animals Asia, but I always kept the animal rights side on the down low at work, and then I kept my work separate. But it was through just so many requests, like, you know, I'm looking for a vegan practitioner, that I said, hey, you know what, this is, this is really important. People do need help. So ask, right? Um, and you may 
find in five years your doctors could be changing alongside with you. Okay? Um, go for your regular checkups, as I said. Okay? Keep reports. So this is really important. Always keep your records. If your doctors don't call you back, don't assume everything is okay. Always call and get a copy. Because you have to know in the medical system, they're still simply looking for disease states. So if you're anything within the bars, they'll say you're healthy and normal and you won't get a call back. But I have caught so many things before where people are already way off one side or the other. And they should have started treatment two, two years ago. But because we're still within the so-called normal, they don't do anything about it. Check your systems, okay? So self-monitor your sleep, your digestion, your energy, your mood, you know, at the minimum, okay? Now, um, because there's so much to cover, I wanted to focus on the diet part because I think this is important. Most of us who are vegan are still not eating what I call a whole food plant-based diet, which is the vegan diet that will give you the maximum health benefits. So this is what we should be eating. And you guys can check in with yourself, write a little diet diary of everything you eat every day and see how close you are and just do it bit by bit and see, you know what, what can I do for the next week to get closer to the ideal vegan diet? So implementing a whole food plant-based diet it's a lot of vegetables, okay? Eight to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables every single day. Obviously, if you're a little smaller, you're a little bigger, you can go up and down these, dope, these amounts, but eight to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables, two servings of beans and legumes. Do all of you eat beans and legumes every day? Yeah, good, okay. Um, consume only intact grains, and I'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide. Um, one to two servings of nuts and seeds, herbs and spices, plenty of water, and reduce your salt and fat intake. And you don't have to go, you know, there's a lot of like zero fat cooking and all that. I always say you don't have to go zero fat, but keep the fat low. So about the intact grains, okay, not all carbs are equal. Um, you know, in North America, most people consume 80 to 90% of their grains as processed grains. And a diet that's rich in refined carbs will put you at risk of overeating, obesity, cholesterol issues, blood pressure, heart disease, insulin dysregulation, gastrointestinal issues, cancers, right? Inflammation and liver disease. Um, so it's really important that we learn what is an intact grain. You know how many people have asked in my practice, like what grain do you think is healthy? They all tell me whole wheat bread, all of them. Whole wheat bread. Who, which, who of you think whole wheat bread is good? And how many of you eat whole wheat bread all the time? I'm really impressed. Wow. That's less than what I see in my office. But mind you, most of my patients are still not vegan, vegetarian by any means. So an intact grain. So any grain that's been refined, flaked, milled into a cereal, made into a flour, pasta, that sort of thing is considered as a refined grain. When you refine something, you automatically reduce 50 to 90% of its nutrients and fiber, right? And you're gonna drastically increase the glycemic index, which causes sugar spikes, you know, things like mood swings and all that. I see this a lot where people feel grouchy, you know, after they eat something refined, you know, an hour or two later. So there's some, there's definitely some mood issues going on there too. So instead, consume uh, root vegetables. So I often say try to get your um, carbs, you know, from a sweet potato, from taro, from, you know, something that is a root vegetable, legumes, vegetables, fruits, these are actually all carbohydrates. Um, unprocessed whole grains such as brown rice, millet, quinoa, buckwheat, and teff. They're wonderful grains. And the way you cook does matter, okay? So we know that, um, so there's a big raw food movement, but I want to tell you not everyone likes raw, not everyone can eat raw, but I do suggest eating some raw every day. But the key is cooking your food at a low temperature. So steaming, cooking under 248 degrees will keep a lot of your nutrients intact. So even soups, even things like water cooking. So what water cooking means, you can use a little bit of oil in the beginning to get your pan going, but afterwards you're putting water in to bring down the temperature and letting your food fully cook, um, almost like a steaming boiling function. And usually that still retains a lot of your nutrients. And 
do avoid high heat grilling, frying, um, because it can produce what we call polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are no carcinogens. And I noticed, you know, a lot of the vegan plant-based foods are still fried and all that. So, you know, just like when you were not vegan, you would keep those foods at a minimal. You really have to follow that. It's happen very occasionally, but not something frequently. Um, try sprouting. When you sprout your grains and seeds, you actually increase the nutrition of your, your seed and grain by up to 500%. And if people have difficulty starting off with beans, especially people transitioning to veganism, beans may not have been anything you wanted to ever eat before, right? Ooh, kidney beans, right? <laughs> and you might have trouble digesting them. So number one thing is how to prepare your beans is really important. Um, for easy digestibility is to soak them first. Like before you cook them, soak them overnight. Um, that really helps to remove lectins and phytates and then when you cook them, it's going to be much less gassy. And you also want to get rid of all the water when you cook it. So don't cook the beans in your soup and eat it like that. Cook it on its own, take it out of the water and then put it into your rice or soups. Um, another thing is if that still gives you, you know, some GI upset, then sprout them to begin with. Like I've had lots of patients where they just weren't used to eating beans and they're trying to be vegan, but they're just like having gas, like immense gas. So I said sprout your beans first. Um, start with lentils, you know, sprout them. And, and it only takes a few days. Um, when you sprout something, it almost um, automatically will help the, the bean itself digest it. So it become very digestible, low gas, and you're increasing the nutrients by a lot. Okay, water cooking, as I said, is really good. Um, and try to eat some raw every single day, you know, like a little bit of raw onions, a little bit of raw chai, something like that, because it's really good to keep your microbiome healthy. So a little bit raw, because, you know, when there's little traces of soil, little traces of, um, of uh, raw nutrients, it helps your microbiome in your gut to thrive. And this is another thing when we talk about B12 and iron, is that often it's also because we're not absorbing properly, so we have malabsorption. Important nutrients that you should know about. Um, now this is again, not just for vegan vegetarians. A lot of people ask me, is it just vegans that need B12? And I can tell you that B12, iron, vitamin D, zinc, omega-3, iodine, and calcium um, are low in almost everyone. Okay, some of my most B12 iron deficient patients are actually meat eaters and they're coming in with severely low B12, you know, where we're doing injections and there's a reason why, but we'll talk about what these um, nutrients do and why they're so important and why, you know, don't get lazy, you know, really try to get the foods in. If you're not getting the foods in, then get a supplement in. So B12, um, really important for brain function, nervous system, uh, blood cell production, energy production, metabolism. So if you notice that you're getting sluggish, tired, if you experience numbness, tingling, mood swings, anything like that, you know, you need to be assessed to see if you're B12 deficient. And a simple blood test can actually let us know if you're low in B12. Iron, right? A lot of people are concerned about iron. Um, and iron is really important because it helps to form hemoglobin, which um, brings oxygen to all our cells. So if you start noticing you're tired all the time, you're losing hair, right? You know, that's a classic symptom, is check your iron status. Uh, and again, you can do this through blood panel. Vitamin D is important for every single person. If you live in Canada, you are vitamin D deficient. I don't know a single Canadian that is not vitamin D deficient, <laughs> except if you live in Florida. <laughs> You might be okay. There's still a lot of deficiency in Florida. There still is, yeah, because we don't go outside, right? We're still indoors, um, and most of the sunlight we get is when we're driving or on the bus, which doesn't count. So vitamin D is really important. You can get a vitamin D blood test done and see if you're in the optimal range. So the, right now is a busy vitamin D testing time for me. I usually get a lot of patients get their vitamin D, uh, vitamin D tested so I can optimize them for the winter. Um, because a lot of people feel just terrible in the winter. Like they're mood swinging, they're tired, they get sick all the time, and it can be contributed to low vitamin D. Zinc is important, right? Zinc supports the immune system, wound healing, cell division, male health. It's really important to get zinc in. Omega-3, okay, omega-3 we all know, good for the brain, good for the eyes, 
cell support, mood, skin, hormones, um, iodine, which is for uh, thyroid function, and everyone knows about calcium. Um, and I didn't li really like to isolate calcium on its own, but I figure most people know calcium. Is there's a there's a belief that if you're a vegan, you know, you're going to be greatly calcium deficient, and then we must use cow's milk to get you know calcium, which you don't need. You can actually get really good quality calcium from plant-based sources, which are far superior to dairy sources. Um, so for those of you who are vegetarian, who are looking at getting rid of dairy, please do. I mean, dairy is the number one most inflammatory food that you can obtain. And, you know, when I treat patients with autoimmune, arthritis, eczema, things like that, I mean, the number one thing we get out first is dairy. Um, there's so many things about dairy, we can talk an hour about it. But transition over and, and you can get your calcium from plant-based sources, okay? So, where do you get these nutrients? So, B12, there's not a really reliable food source at the moment because B12 is actually from bacteria in the soil. So what happens is most of our food is washed, um, also soil depletion. Soils are now treated with a lot of chemicals um, and herbicides, pesticides. So I mean, the amount of B12 that we're getting from our foods is really poor. And that's why most people that I test are B12 deficient. And so it's important that you probably will need a B12 supplement as to how much you need depends on your starting amount in your blood. So if you're really low, you may need more. If you're pretty good, you may not need as much because some of us will absorb B12 better than others. Um, if you're a very poor absorber, then there's probably something going on with your gut function that we need to optimize. And some people need to start off with B12 injections first and then move on to the sublingual oral form. Um, iron, lots of good sources of iron like cashews, pumpkin seeds, lentils, mushrooms, peas, string beans, prune juice, nuts and seeds. Lots of the dark green leafy vegetables will also have iron. Uh, vitamin D, of course, the best way is to get natural sunlight. So it's hard here because from the fall till the winter, the, the way that, I'm not very good with you know how the, world, how the earth moves, but it's the way that we're positioned, even when we're outside, the sun ray hits the skin at an angle that doesn't really help us manufacture vitamin D. So it's just naturally in Canada, we're gonna be deficient. So you do need to take one. Um, every day, and, and, and dosage again depends on your starting amount, um, but for sure between fall to winter to spring, I suggest vitamin D supplementation every single day with a fatty meal or something with fat, like even with a handful of nuts is good enough. Um, some people are fine in the summer, depends how much you're outside and what time you're outside, uh, but some people aren't. If, you're, if you have an office job and you're inside nine to five by the time you're out at sun setting, you may not even get enough vitamin D in the summertime. Um, zinc, lots of food sources, um, tofu, hemp seeds, lentils, oatmeal, wild rice, squash and pumpkin seeds, quinoa, black beans, peas, spinach, mushrooms, avocados, and so forth. So the list is there. Lots of great sources of zinc. Um, Omega-3 is great. Uh, get it from flax oil or walnuts, chia seeds, you can also now get um, vegan omega-3s that are made with algae. Um, and then there's iodine, which you can get from seaweed. So eat some kuzu, eat some kelp, um, try to incorporate it as something regular in your diet, throw in your soups to get the iodine. And with calcium, lots of the dark green leafy vegetables are great for calcium. Um, one thing to note though, is that things like spinach, Swiss chard, and beet greens you don't absorb the, the calcium as well as some other greens like broccoli and kale. So the different greens do kind of have a difference. So I went through that pretty fast, which is great. I left you guys time for Q&A. Do you guys have any questions? And I want to hear what your concerns are. We have smoothies at home, but we don't have the vitamins. Mm -hmm. Does that take the nutrients away? If you're under 240 degrees, you're still going to keep a lot of the nutrients. So I wouldn't be too worried about that. Um, and actually when you, when you uh, blend something, it releases a lot of the nutrients out. But the key with smoothies and juicing and all that is the key is to drink it right away. So you know some people like to do it the night before or they go out and buy something that's pre-made. Within 30 minutes, the nutrients start to oxidize very quickly. So it's more so important you drink it. And you know, don't leave it on for like three minutes or something. You can also give it breaks so that it doesn't get too hot. Because I know something like the Vitamix can get really hot, right? But that's usually if you repetitively keep it on for like over a minute. 
but you can actually take a break, let it cool down a little bit, or just add some ice. Um, just to comment on uh, juices and uh, smoothies, I heard that um, as stupid as, as it seems that uh, it's beneficial to like chew them, like mm. something about the enzymes in your mouth helping helping to digest it. Do you have? Yeah, absolutely. So I don't suggest just doing juicing. You should definitely eat your vegetables because there's a lot of digestive enzymes that are already starting in the mouth. So you're starting to liberate the nutrients um, from the food. So it should always be a combination. Um, eating, juicing, smoothies, yeah, that's a good point, yeah. Seems like the practitioners uh, advocating vegan diets are saying like minimal oil or no oil. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering like what is, what is your stance on that? Usually we suggest anywhere between one to two tablespoons max a day of oil because oil is sort of equivalent to sugar in carbs, you know, you're using the pure oil form. We try to get the oils, and if, if you want to look at a whole food plant-based diet, is you want to even get your oils as a whole food, which would be from the plant itself. So eating the chia seeds, um, eating the actual avocado instead of using the avocado oil. Um, so it's okay to use a little bit of oil to cook, like, you know, if you need to get that pan going, but I would suggest adding water right away to drop the temperature down. So what we suggest is even for salad dressings, a lot of people are used to doing the olive oil with balsamic. I ask people to now use tahini, right? Use tahini sesame paste or like a nut paste to, to start it off and then add water to it and then you put your lemon juice in there. So you're now doing a completely like, like refined oil-free dressing, but you're still getting all the omegas and um, it is important because all the studies do show that a high fat diet will increase your mortality. So we do want to, we do see that low fat diets are beneficial, but we do need some fat. You have to know our brain needs fat, um, our hormones need fat, so you can't be completely zero fat, but you do need it, you do want to get it from your whole foods. Seeds, nuts, avocados, those are great sources. So there are lots of forms of vitamin C, magnesium. It depends on what your needs are. So even magnesium, there's about four different forms of magnesium. Some are more specific for neurological use. So let's say someone has anxiety and stress, you may use magnesium bisglycinate. But if you're looking at more constipation and other things, you may be using magnesium citrate. And then there's another one that's more for hypertension. So it kind of depends what your needs are. And then, because the vitamins, you have to know there are such a huge variance in quality of supplements out there. And often patients don't know what's a good brand, what's not a good brand. Um, I still have lots of patients who go to Costco to get their supplements, which I don't suggest. I mean, they've done studies on some of the supplements. They're just not very absorbable. So what we try to suggest are um, companies that are uh, that have third-party testing. So which means they've hired a company that's not associated with them to test their products and make sure they're absorbable, they're dissolvable, right? Even dissolvability has been an issue with some supplements where they don't even dissolve properly, so you won't be getting much of it, right? Um, the form also depends on you, right? If you have a great digestive tract. So for instance, calcium, if you're a young female or male under 30, you got a really strong stomach, um, you can just do a plain calcium carbonate with magnesium and vitamin D, like a basic combo. But if you're older, usually what we see is the acid content, the pH starts to increase in the stomach, you might need a calcium citrate form. So it depends on your age and what your needs are. Um, and someone, if you have a good health professional like a nutritionist, a naturopath, they'll go through and see, you know, what forms of vitamins are beneficial for you. Mm -hmm. Yes, because I mean, there's a whole thing about orthogenics and that if you have hypothyroidism, you should avoid cruciferous vegetables. It's really quite silly, I can tell you. It's, it, it's not true. I mean, they have, because when you're eating the vegetable, um, it's not going, it's going to have other nutrients that balance it out as well. So I still have all my hypothyroid patients continue to eat the orthogenic foods, but they'll space them out. So I don't suggest eating like four cups of broccoli a day, but they may have a little bit, but then they'll have non orthogenic foods on top. And especially if you're already being treated for it, like let's say you're on medication or bioidentical hormones and your values are stable, then you don't have to worry so much. Yeah, but they're beneficial, so I would still incorporate them. Maybe not at the very, very beginning. Like if you're full on hypothyroid and you're really 
struggling, then maybe for a brief period of time, it's get your values normalized, and then you can bring them back into your diet. Can you have too many supplements? I know sometimes in health stores they recommend a lot of supplements. I need this type of supplement. Mm -hmm. They say you can never have too many. Your body just excels it. Is that true? No, that is not true. And I do have patients who come in with garbage bags full of supplements, and it is a bit worrisome. You know, um, number one is it depends on what supplements you're on. Um, if you're just going to a health food store, you have to know that they don't know what you're taking. Right? There could already be trace minerals in your other supplement and you don't need them again. So they could already be there. I mean, the studies do show that the whole food, plant-based foods are the best sources of your vitamins, not supplements. But the supplements are important if you're not getting it from your diet. So I don't advise people you know, being on a million supplements because then you might think, oh, I've already gotten my vitamins. I don't have to eat as well, which is not the right way to think. Um, but also, certain vitamins can accumulate in the body, okay, so if they're lipid soluble like vitamin D, vitamin A, vitamin K, vitamin E, they can actually build up in the system. Um, iron can build up in the system, even plant-based iron, so everything can be too much. Um, and so you do want to be cautious and um, not overtake certain things because you, number one, may not need it. You may be wasting your money, um, and it is a lot of stuff for your body to digest, right? Um, especially if you're starting to feel nauseous or you start feeling some heartburn or discomfort, then you have to reassess what you're taking. Yeah, but I don't, I don't believe that statement that, oh, nothing is ever too much. Everything can be too much after a while. Yeah, <laughs> no problem. Yes, in the back. So nightshades are found primarily in, in potatoes, eggplant, um, uh, corn, mushrooms, peppers. Um, and nightshade vegetables, if you're in a full inflammatory state, like let's say you're coming in with severe arthritis or eczema, um, I do cut them out from the diet for a period of time. And there's a really good way of actually checking if you have sensitivities, is you can do a food sensitivity test. Now, sometimes it'll pick it up and sometimes it won't. It depends how inflamed you are. If you're really inflamed, I would cut them out for six weeks to eight weeks, and then I'll reintroduce them back slowly. But I have had patients with arthritis, and they're pain-free, they grow tomatoes in their garden, they go and eat a pint, and the next day they have knee pain. Um, so they can be inflammatory um, if you eat too much of it. Um, but again, they do have healthy nutrients in them, so I don't suggest cutting them way out. But in the beginning of your treatment for something inflammatory, I would cut them out for a period of time to give your body a break. Talk about uh, caffeine and alcohol in general. In general? So caffeine is a very interesting thing, and I, I'm always mixed about caffeine because there are there's good research about caffeine and it being good for your heart and circulation, which is true. Um, but one thing that we know is is that it is very inflammatory. So when we look at acid-base balance, alkaline versus acidic foods, um, you know we know that dairy is probably the number one most inflammatory food. But when we talk about acidity. Uh, coffee and pop are probably the top two most acidic foods. So if someone's suffering from things like arthritis, osteoporosis, something that is inflammatory, we try to alkalinize the body. And it's very hard to alkalinize the body when you're intaking coffee. Um, and it's something about two to three cups of alkaline water just to combat one cup of coffee. So what we do in our clinic is we do pH testing, is you can actually buy pH strips and test your saliva and urine. And if you are always very acidic, then I cut out the coffee completely and we work on alkalinizing. And, and it depends how acidic you are. And unfortunately, most of us are highly acidic. And as we get older, as our body ages and we degenerate, we become increasingly acidic. Um, and so for myself, I don't consume much coffee at all. You know, I find it too acidic for me. I maybe have one a week or so. Um, and also my patients who are arthritic, especially arthritic, or they have an injury, tendonitis, they're off coffee, at least for the healing period until they're completely better. And then we may add it back. For alcohol, I mean, alcohol, is a toxin. I mean, I always say, I mean, red wine has some health benefits with the resveratrol and the antioxidants, but you have to have it in a very limited quantity. Um, a lot of people drink beer, but beer is very yeasty, right? So, you know, yeast in, a, in excess can cause multitude of health issues. 
Um, and so alcohol in small doses for sure. Um, and usually the red wine is what I suggest and not so much the beers. Um, and I'm not very good with my wines. I can you know, mix drinks with all the sugar. A lot of the cocktails have a lot of sugar in them. I don't advise that. So in Chinese medicine, we don't advise drinking cold water um, because Cold water goes through and right to the kidneys, right? In Chinese medicine, kidney is what we call the center of fire. It's actually what brings all the vitality and the heat to our body. Um, so in Chinese medicine, we always advise drinking only warm, hot water um, because it nourishes you. When you drink cold, it impedes your qi and blood circulation. So this is a bit of Chinese medicine terminology. Um, and so I only drink warm even when it's hot weather. I still drink warm water or lukewarm water. It's not hot water from the pipes, guys. Don't turn on the hot water because you're going to get all the copper and everything that's in the pipes that's been sitting there for 100 years. Better is you filter your water, filter and then boil it. Okay? And, and I'm not even a big fan of tap water, to be honest, because it is heavily treated with fluoride now. Yes. There's a lot of conflicting information on the dose of vitamin D. Mm -hmm. So what do you recommend? The safest thing you do is get a blood test done. Okay, there's an optimal range and a suboptimal range. Um, you know, lately I've been testing almost every patient I see, and, and it's not an OHIP covered test, but it's only thirty-five dollars. So if you ask your family doctor to get it checked. Um, just say, I'm willing to pay, because often they'll be like, oh, you don't need it, just take vitamin D. But how much, right? Um, the dosage is huge. Like the, It can range from 2,000 to 10,000. It depends on what you're at. Um, I've had some patients recently with vitamin D so low that I'm putting them on 10,000 IUs a day. And some people are very sufficient, so they're only on two, 3,000. Um, so it depends on your starting amount, but the average adult, let's say the average adult, need about 3,000 IUs per day um, during the fall and the winter, um, and depends what their levels are. If they're good, they can get off of it in the summertime, um, but I mean, I'm telling you, I'm seeing really low vitamin D levels lately where I'm putting people on eight to 10,000, you know, for at least the first month, and then 6,000, and then you know, until they're optimal. So um, the best is to get a blood test done first, and then after six months, you recheck it. Um, but optimal vitamin D is so important. And when we talk about calcium, it's so important you have good vitamin D levels because that is what helps you absorb ca uh, calcium from your foods. If you have low vitamin D, you're also not going to be absorbing calcium very well. Um, in your immune system, we know vitamin D is great for preventing vir viral infections. So if you're looking at flu prevention, what's the best flu preventer is vitamin D, right? If, if you're sick, pop some vitamin D in. Uh, but again, it's a fat-soluble vitamin, so you do need to take it with some fat yeah. in the meal. So not don't take it with like an apple or something. It's not going to absorb very well. Yes. What are your thoughts on raw food and mm. how it can weaken your digestion? I have a lot of mixed feelings with raw food because being a Chinese medicine practitioner, if you read every Chinese medicine book, it always says avoid raw foods, right? <laughs> um, so in the Chinese culture, you'll see that we rarely eat raw. Everything is cooked and that's how we grew up. Everything is cooked, stir-fried, boiled, steamed. Um, rarely do we eat raw. So this whole raw, raw food vegan diet was actually really new to me, um, but I, I looked into it to understand it a little more. And so my take on it is a bit of raw is really good every day, but not everyone can do it right away. If you have very weak um, digestive issue, especially if you have IBS, inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's, um, and your digestion is really weak, I find that often we have to cook the foods first. It's also to kill off any bacteria and stuff that's contaminated in raw foods, because even we know now with romaine, you can get E. coli, right? So you have to be very careful, and, and you have to train your body to eat raw, because not all of us are good with raw. It also depends eth ethnically where you're from. Like being Southeast Asian, um, I mean, we don't, we have not for generations eaten much raw. So what I noticed was I wasn't digesting raw well. Like it would actually make me feel tired and cold, Right? And so it depends on your constitution. Um, and in Chinese medicine, it's really cool because we look at every person, you have a unique constitution. So you could be a cool person, someone could be very hot and warm, some people can be very damp, right? And I find the cool, damp constitution people have a hard time eating raw. 
and you have to incorporate it slowly. You might even have to put some ginger in when you juice, just to warm up the drink. And what I suggest sometimes is actually warming your drink a little bit. So like when you, if you're Vitamixing, Vitamix it a little longer to warm it up a little bit, because that might help your, your bowels to digest it better. And in Chinese medicine, people who, let's say, we call it spleen qi deficiency, um, have a very hard time with hard uh, with raw food. Right away, they get you know the the, the phlegm in the throat. Um, they feel tired. Um, and but I find people who let's say originated from the tropics, tropical zones like Jamaicans, like Caribbeans, you know they can do a lot of raw because they're used to it. Like I think it's also partially. I'm not sure if it's genetic, but it could be they they've been trained even as a kid to eat a lot of raw. Um, so it is important to train though, because it's just like learning how to ride a bike. If you don't train your body to eat raw, you won't be able to eat it either. So start slow and incorporate just a little bit of it. And you can even start off with things like, if you can't eat raw very well, um, sprout. Sprout some seeds, sprout some things. Start off with adding sprouts. Start off with less cool vegetables, you know, like carrots and uh, beets. They're not considered cooling. And then you can slowly add in more of the celery and all that because those are kind of more cooling yeah yes you haven't mentioned fermented foods very much yeah so fermentation is great yes so there's lots of ways to ferment just make sure you don't mold them but i mean fermentation is really important to keep a healthy biome we didn't really talk about the biome because that could be another hour but we can we can loop that in about the b12 and iron malabsorption is that most people today don't have a healthy gut I mean, how many of you have had antibiotics in your life? Like every single one of us, right? So we get our initial immunization of probiotics from our mother when we're born, but most of us lose all that because we have had antibiotics or we've had bad diet, stress, which will kill off a lot of the healthy biome in the GI tract. Um, and so one way to get it back is through fermentation. So if you know how to ferment, if you don't know how to, you can learn how to. Um, nowadays, a lot of people make kombucha at home. Um, they ferment their own, uh, pickle their own food. So very healthy. I highly, highly recommend it. Yeah. So the question was, um, if you have an autoimmune disease, how would you um, work on controlling the inflammation. So the first thing is you have to find out what's inflaming you, what could be setting off your immune system. I always start off with the diet because that's something you're exposed to three times a day. Um, and we do panels where we do blood testing to look at food sensitivities. Um, a lot of people, even vegans, are sensitive to gluten, are sensitive to um, even some nightshades, and some things you would never even consider um, is to work on the diet first. Um, and clean up your environment because um, the toxicity is so high. Like if you think about non-organic fruits and vegetables, I mean blueberries can on average have 22 to 30 pesticides, herbicides on them. Is clean up your body with eating more organic because you will be putting less strain on your immune system. Um, so it is important to eat organic and if you guys go to the environmental working group ewg.org, um, they update their dirty dozen lists all the time. Is if, if organic is too expensive, at least choose the dirty dozen and buy organic, or just don't eat them at all. You know, we're talking about berries, apples, strawberries. Um, a lot of times our immune system is greatly uh, impacted by the environment. So um, reducing toxicity, look at what you use at home. I mean, because most of you guys are vegan, a lot of you are also using vegan-based products, which is great, because a lot of the vegan um, home care products, cleaning products, are usually eco-friendly as well. But if some of you are still using things like Windex and Tide and all that, know that there are chemicals in there that are fully banned in Europe, but we're still widely using them. And that's also another inflammatory agent. Um, so look at your whole surrounding and see how you can reduce inflammation. But the diet is the number one place you should start off with. And one thing we didn't, I didn't really touch on because it's a bit complicated, but um, it's parasites, yeast, um, and bacteria. Um, is a lot of people do have an accumulation of parasites, yeast, and bacteria, uh, which can really trigger the inflammatory response. So part of the healing the gut part, like people with leaky gut, IBS, inflammatory bowel disease, is you have to eradicate all of the stuff from your body, eliminate the inflammation, and then you repair the gut. And we usually use things like herbs and all that to help to heal the, the gut line. Yeah. Probiotics, right? <laughs> the naturopathic community as a whole, my experience and the experience of many people I know is being um, that meat is really important. 
It is true. I mean, it's, it's really sad, and that's why I thought, you know, I really have to educate my own, my own colleagues as well. As in the naturopathic college still, um, we learn a lot of holistic nutrition, but not vegan plant-based nutrition at all. It's still very new. Um, a lot of my colleagues are learning things like paleo and keto and all of that. Um, and it's really unfortunate, um, and that's why starting in the fall, I'm going to be starting to teach a course at the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine on plant-based nutrition. So I hope they receive it well, because that's my goal, is to educate my own professions, uh, professions in, in plant-based eating and how important it is. Um, but you're absolutely right, like I've had a lot of patients transfer to me because their, their own naturopathic doctor suggested them to be on a paleo diet or you can't survive without me, you know, I've got that before. Um, and I think it's lack of education, we're really not quite there yet as a whole medical community and so, I mean, we have, um, now we have great experts, right? Um, Dr. Josh is here, right? That's Dr. Josh, and he's from Hippocrates, and you know, you've been a huge leader in teaching plant-based medicine, and so, I mean, I think it'll be our responsibility to try to educate our fellow colleagues on this, but I know it's challenging. A lot of people think as a naturopath, you know, they should be fully supportive of these. <laughs> no, not quite there, hopefully soon. Good, the time, great.